Yeah. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome to the continuation of Scientists in Synagogues of uh, What is a Human. And uh, last or two weeks ago, we, we started our biology lesson with Matt. And tonight, we continue with uh, Dr. Susan Robinson, who, uh, who is the president of our synagogue, also, uh, uh, but also, and also, <laughs> and also a doctor, a scientist, a entrepreneur, a uh, and just a all around wonderful person. And now I have to live up to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just to give you a little bit more background about myself, um, I love science. I'll start with that. And I became a scientist when I studied uh, biochemistry. I have a PhD in biomedical sciences from Mount Sinai Medical School in New York. And I've spent many, many, many years in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I won't tell you how many years. And the last 16 or 17 years of that was at Novartis. When I left Novartis, I went out looking for some technology. I always wanted to do this on my own, become the entrepreneur. And since then, I founded two companies, both of which I'm still involved in the management. And in one case, developing a product for ARDS, acute respiratory distress, um, the thing that most people with COVID died from. Yeah. And a second company where we're developing a product for um, women's menopausal health. So in my spare time, I'm happy to be here at Hemp Temple <laughs> and I'm very excited to share a little bit of science and a little bit of thought about the value of human life tonight. So let me go ahead and share my slides. My head blocking, we can take the of course. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not letting me. Your head's not that big. Yeah. <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. It doesn't let me move the slides. I think I'm not going to put it in full screen because it doesn't let me move the slides. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about the value of human life. What is on there? Okay, so can we actually determine the value of a human life? Well, there's different ways that we could look at that. We can look at it from a spiritual sense, from a religious sense, and it makes us think of things like the sanctity of life and that we're made in the image of God. And it also is tied to being adhering to a set of rituals or values. And maybe Rabbi would like to share another thought or two on that. Right, well, I mean, in, in Jewish thought, I would say one life you know, there's a famous there's a famous statement in in the Mishnah, which is a, a rabbinic law from 1800 years ago, that when you are a witness in a, um, in a capital offense, they make you say this formula before you can be in the in the trial. And one of the things you say is that say if if, uh, if you kill one person, it says if you kill the whole world, right? If you save one person, it says if you save the whole world. And so. Um, which goes back to the beginning of, of the book of Genesis that we're created in the image of God. And so every life is infinite, and yet we still have to make calculations sometimes. Yes. Right? We'll Which I know we'll talk about. We'll talk about So hold that, hold that thought. Yeah. So then if you think about this societal way of valuing life and, um, you know, just walking around, people think about, oh, that person's famous or... Um, you know, people competing for who who dies with the most toys or, you know, who has the most friends, the most admirers, um, who's the most educated, who's the wealthiest. So these are some of the how society values our lives. But there's no numbers there either. Then we get to science or technical analyses, legal, those sorts of things. And all of a sudden, things get associated with numbers. So we're talking about insurers who pay for 
either life insurance or health insurance um, payers who pay for the drugs that we take. The government, of course, who's got a big health care budget, um, or the courts who value a life in either a civil or criminal um, court case. But in these cases, at, at the fundamentals, we at least believe there's a right to life. Um, and that's, you know, the underpinnings of some of the um, analyses that are done scientifically, technically. But there's other ways of looking at it that are much more um, economical, a lot of math. The economic, what's the value of a life in numbers or a life year? And there's a methodology called quality adjusted life year, QALY, that's in particular used to estimate the years of life remaining for a patient after they've been treated with a drug or an intervention. And they weigh each year and the value of that additional year on a scale of zero to one. Then we also are familiar with actuarial tables that we know life insurance companies um, used to charge us for life insurance. Oh, this one's only going to last a year or maybe a hundred years. And, um, so talking about the economic value of life from the U.S. perspective, I got this from that great um, authority, Wikipedia. <laughs> um, this is specific to the United States. So they, in the U.S., we've applied very, a variety of values to a life. Um, there's one thing called the dialysis standard, which was put into place to determine whether it's worth, worth it for the government to pay for a year of dialysis for a patient based on whether they're going to live. Um, that was an international standard that is now up to $129,000 per year of quality of life. Um, other valuations here, FEMA says a life in 2020 is worth seven and a half million dollars. Um, the EPA says in 2010 was 9.1 million dollars. And the Department of Transportation looks at in 2016 and says 9.6 million dollars. So there's a lot of different ways to value a life here in the US. But what's interesting is what if the life is not in the US? Right, yeah. So the World Health Organization takes the gross domestic product of a country and figures out per person what's the what's called the per capita GDP. And they suggest that if a particular treatment that you're looking at costs less than three times that figure for a year of good health, then it's worth paying for it. Well, that's okay if your country's per capita GDP were $65,000, which it is in the US, it's actually a little higher than that. This is a little, a little bit out of a few years old. Um, so then that says it's worthwhile to treat a patient for, with something that costs less than $195,000 for one year of good health. Okay, that's your quality adjusted life year in the US according to this WHO standard. But think about it. What's the per capita GDP for Uganda? $964. And for Israel, you can see I biased in doing this research. It's $55,000, pretty good. Iran, $4,669. And then I said to myself, well, what country should I go to? Who has the highest per capita GDP? Turns out we should all be going to Bermuda, $118,000. Tourist dollars. <laughs> Good Lord, wow. So this is from a New York Times article, um, which you can source. Uh, so if you think about it, what does it mean? Uh, is a life worth more in the US than it is in these other countries? Of course not, although maybe some people feel that is the case. But it's an interesting thought. So do we really need to set a numerical value on a life? I don't know if people have opinions about that, but um, we're using it an awful lot in, as I mentioned earlier, the civil or criminal justice system to value a life, um, commercially in actuarial tables, in 
interestingly, in decisions whether to treat disease, um, for example, that dialysis standard, um, including pandemics. So somebody could decide that it's not worth it to invest the money to treat. I mean, the government paid to, to vaccinate all of us. And so obviously valued our lives at that level, as well as the economy, of course, that went with us. Um, but it's also about health intervention pricing. So what, how important is it to pay for surgery for any particular life or lives in general, or for diagnostics to find out what the diseases are that then need to be treated, or, and this is pretty controversial, not so much controversial, but a subject of much talk, how about preventative care? Um, we don't do a very good job in this country of preventative care, and Obviously, somebody's weighed the balance and decided that it's better to take care of illness than to take care of prevention. And that's how our system is set up. Yeah. I'm just saying, in the, when you're calculating the value of a human life, and we're only looking at one individual, but suppose we look at someone who is suffering from a terrible illness, we can keep that person alive at a cost of $200,000 a year. Or should we say to that person, I am sorry, well, but I could save a lot of other lives and make a lot of other lives a lot better if I don't treat you. Well, that is at the core of the debate and many discussions that are going on in this country right now. And actually, this is a perfect setup for my next slide. Right. And I want, <laughs> and I want to say, and I want to say, like, the, the Bible, the Torah talks about this, too, yeah. in the context of justice, though. Right? We misread the section eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? And the rabbis read it, and 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 some biblical scholars say you can see this from other law codes in the Middle East at the time that it meant how much is an eye worth to you, to the person who lost their eye? And therefore, you have to compensate for that. How much is a tooth worth for the person who lost the tooth? But then there's always life to life that once you kill another person, then it's all to worth, right? So... Thinking of these calculations uh, is something that humans have to do, ha do right? Or have done forever, right? We talked about that in our Saturday class. Yeah, yeah. Also just that, you know, the eye for eye means your eye, not your entire family's right, eyes. Right, right. So, yeah, then we can talk about <laughs> collecting punishment and things like yeah. that that would have to do with that. But it has to do with, like, if your job was, was to be a... A spotter for something and you lost your eye then you can't do your job sure. anymore and therefore that eye is worth something and that person has to compensate Constantly. right so so thinking about what life is worth is is something that humans have always done even though we like to think in universals it's actually a very specific it can be a very specific thing if you want to be ethical right? i think it's interesting that the calculation is done in an aggregate way mm -hmm. so like Every human in the United States is based on the general GDP of the United States instead of saying, like, well, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm not advocating for this, by the way. I'm yeah, saying, no, like, no, I understand. Instead of saying, like, well, your family historically has contributed. Yeah. Race. I mean, that would create a tiered citizenship, right? And no very way. Quickly. <laughs> right? Not that we don't already have one. <laughs> like, that would be very blatant. <laughs> but I think that's something that the, the Torah is fighting against yeah. in, in, in what I was saying. But there are societies for a long time that had a tiered situation. Uh, the king's life, the same as uh, far uh, you know. my child's life, so the same king as food taster. Rabbi, unfortunately, your right. child's life. Right, right. You mean, for me, unfortunately. Right. So when you when you think in utilitarian terms, it's everybody is equal. But for you, your kid is not equal to another person's kid. You, their life is worth more to you. But isn't this what they what they do when there have been these tragedies in suits like after 9-11 mm -hmm. when there was, I can't remember the name of the man that ultimately was in charge of figuring out how much to compensate mm -hmm. the families of the different people when they factored in, I thought, um, in the case, say, of a cook that would, you know, died from the World Trade Center, that how many people did he support? How old was he? How many more years 
uh, working life did he have? How old were his children? You know, so mm -hmm. that they came up with numerical, yep. you know, yes, values guess... that did, that were different for yeah. the different people depending on circumstances. Great. And I think I guess you can do that in a situation where you have a limited population, but other places like drug pricing, which is where we're getting to eventually, um, you have to look across a population. You can't say this person deserves that cancer drug more than that person, um, aside from the complexity of it. Probably just but we, we do have wealth that determines levels of care. I mean, you can yeah. get concierge doctors, <laughs> yes. then, for example. Mm -hmm. We also uh, have things like liver transplants, which have some some moral uh, limits on them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah you so can't a, give it to if, you're a, if you're an alcoholic, alcoholic, you're not jumping to the top of the list. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Right. Or, or age too. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think from a societal perspective, any society only has so much, so much resources to support life, and you have to decide. I think, from a societal point of view, how much is a life worth? Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking back to my my youth. At one point, I wrote a paper about um, the value of um, influenza vaccination, mm -hmm. and we looked at how many lives would be saved by vaccinating people. And how much it would cost to save one year of life, for instance, using vaccines. Yes. And I remember back then there was something, as you point out, called a quali. And the quali, I looked all around, and it was one hundred eighty-nine thousand dollars per year. But wow, isn't that something? How did they come up with that? Well, they just asked a whole bunch of people how much, you know, did they think life was worth, and they sort of came to a composite. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting to me is that, you know, uh, you talk about quality adjusted life years, that one being a, a year of fully good health and less than one being someone who would say compromised. Mm -hmm. Well, if you ask me uh, how much is my life worth right now, given my compromises, I'm gonna value it much higher than somebody mm -hmm. who's 25 years old uh, in perfect health. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, the people in wheelchairs and people who were, you know, still value their lives very highly. So how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. I think as a society, it's mm -hmm. a very important point and not easily solved. And, yeah. and I would also I, add to what you're saying, Matt, 200 years ago, when infant mortality and children mortality was much higher than it is today, people valued older people more, yeah. right? If your kid was sick, you know- It happens. You made yeah. another. Right. Yeah, you had, you had an opportunity to have another. And and uh, and, and so, but in America, I remember we've done the opposite. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like Lieutenant Governor of, oh, yeah. of Texas Lemon basically Lemon. said, let's sacrifice the old people for the young. But I don't think you can move as much as, as uh, sort of unpleasant as it is to put a value on human life and put it in dollar amounts. That if you're a society and allocating funds, you have to do that. Otherwise, you need some tools. You probably you can't. Do. You can't come up with priorities. Right. Well, it's always annoyed me, or not always, the recent decades, that the cancer society has new. Uh, protocols for screening, for mammograms, for colonoscopy, for pap smears, mm -hmm. and what is that based on? Whether it's cost effective to do exactly a mammogram at annual. I'm not getting into my jumping head. No, 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 no. Go ahead. You know, and it's okay to jump ahead. You don't have to have okay. a mammogram every year yeah. anymore. It's because it's not cost effective. It won't cut down the cancer rate significantly. Yeah. Same thing for breast mammograms. Yeah, it, it, that is pretty important. And and that speaks, I think, to the difference between looking at value across a society and looking at an individual. Exactly. Yeah, you know, my value of personal or your is at the highest level. Yeah. Of whereas the yeah. society here is that you guys. Yeah. I think right. I think this came out, if you recall, just go back to the web of your brain. Remember back a couple of years when like the vaccines were first coming out, and there was a rule that was made because of the 
come from COVID, uh, people who, were, who had a history of smoking were got in line first. And there were people really mad about that. And I remember having conversations with people that were like, what, and I said, well, what if, um, what if it just happened to be that the pandemic was about if you'd ever had an alcoholic drink, when <laughs> would you be, you know, what would you be saying about that now? Like, like mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're going to change whether that's fair or not. Yeah. You know, Matt, what you were saying when you, I want to play on that a little bit, when you were saying like, of course, your, your feeling about your value of life is higher to you than other people. To me, it's almost like a set of concentric circles where your value is higher than maybe, you know, certainly your family might be akin to that. Then certain groups that you are affiliated with may have stronger feeling. For those, we see that. I mean, that's one reason why there's wars because you, we don't necessarily see um, the other people in the same way. So it's kind of, to me, there's kind of, and then you could say, well, everyone's equal, then, you know, nobody's equal, right? Too. You could yeah. say it that way also. Yeah. I think also there's the issue of there's people who don't want to continue on because they're in a lot of pain and they have trouble getting permission to say, I'm done and right. have drugs to end their life. Right. And depending on what the values of the hospital you're in also can determine whether that life is prolonged with or without your choice or your family's choice as well. And and so it's it, it's just interesting that it just depends on who who's who's in charge in the moment. Well, well, this is I came here from so I, I want to speak to this specifically. I came here from Canada. Yeah. And while I was a rabbi in Canada, while I was a rabbi in Canada, they passed. Yeah. Federal legislation, yeah. a right to die legislation uh, for doctor assisted uh, dying, right? And, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole process to go through. But Canada, everybody's health care is paid for by the government, right? So the government yeah. has, yeah. has so a say. In it. I mean, here it's, you know, health, you know, private company. I don't know if I can trust them more, but like the government, do they have an incentive? So the, how do you build a structure? And now the debate, though, in Canada is, uh, can we allow people with non-treatable depression yeah. to to end their life? And that may pass like any day now. Like it's it's yeah. Uh, yeah. They put it off for a year. It's supposed to go through last. Year. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so and so uh, that's what who, that's all tied into what we're talking about. I'm curious what non-treatable it's means like, these days. Yeah, treatments have changed. Like what right. are they? They always they continue to right. they continue, continue to change. change. Exactly. Recently, as long as we call change. operation of something, yeah. non non treatable is not a eternal. Right. right. So you know, they have right. a definition somewhere. Well, some, like, but like yeah. Time. Mm-hmm. yeah. But it's not just cancer, cancer or Alzheimer's or or ALS or things like that, right? Just thinking back in the seventies, I seem to remember that the, the whole society got involved in the debate as to who's going to get dialysis treatment. So right, that was that dialysis standard. What back. they called God committees. Yeah. Yeah. And they used to talk a lot about what factors were taken into account, making a decision about a particular individual having access to a very limited system. So, so this has come up in recent times with the you know committees to decide uh, drug pricing and who gets drugs and all yeah. the political debates in the government about um, the pricing of pharmaceutical products. So. So we're talking about value in at least two different ways. There's the financial, which is what you started off talking about, which Mm -hmm. has been referenced to, but then there's personal value. Which is basically some of it is cultural. It all depends on where you stand in the in the universe. Right. What how you look at value. So um you know like the rabbi if you're the individual, you know, you're looking at can I get the money? Do I have the money for a, a treatment, whether it's a drug or an intervention or a surgery or whatever? Um, and you know, how do I how do I pay for what I want? So, and you know, we have a continuum of thinking around that because um, you know, people will go out and buy an iPhone for a thousand dollars and not blink at it, but then they have a copay of. 40 bucks on a prescription. And I know I've been guilty of this myself and said, I don't want to pay that much, but I'm happy to buy a phone. So there's all different levels of values depending on where you are, what your health is like, what your 
family position is and where you see yourself in the future. So that's just the individual and the family. Then think about it from the government perspective. Mm -hmm. They have to think about the budgets. They have to think about the policy battles in Congress and the lobbying that's going on either from the insurers or the pharma companies or the patient advocacy. So it's you need some numbers at least to have the debate. Doesn't mean any of the numbers are right because this is not um, precise science with a hypothesis and the data and proving the answer as Matt spoke about last time. Um, and when you think about governments that, you know, their healthcare budgets, what's a budget for us here in the US is totally different compared to emerging economies where, you know, pricing is completely different because they have no GDP to pay for it. Um, when you look at insurance companies, they're out and pharmacy benefit managers who are the groups that are the intermediaries between you and your doctor and the pharmaceutical company. Like and they're driven profits, yeah. simply profits. There's no innovation. There's This is just um, dollars and cents. And then if you're sitting in the pharma biotech world, which I did for many, many years, um, people often look at the pharmaceutical industry as the evil pharmaceutical industry. But I can tell you from my personal perspective, most of the people who work in these companies, at least those who are in research and development, they're there because they wanna save lives. They wanna improve life. And, um, you know, that's been my experience, at least with the R&D portion of the pharma companies. Of course, they need to report to shareholders, they need to make profits, and they need to make R&D investment choices, which we'll talk about a little bit. We'd love mm -hmm. to share that information. So let's talk about drugs and pricing, but any other comments before I move on? Just, just that you know, again, I'm coming back to this definition of values. In a country with a low GDP, mothers don't value their children less. People don't value their parents less. Mm -hmm. It's a different definition of value. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but sometimes we don't think that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't We don't think that way within our own country right. about poor people right. often, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, to me it's that yeah. kind of... Yeah, we're not one country, we're many countries, but I know well, at, at the risk of veering in an in a incorrect direction, all this talk about value of life and making choices, I just keep thinking about the abortion yeah, right. Yeah. I, I mean, that is just so front and center in my mind right now. Yes. And, and all the stories that we're hearing now, given that Roe was overturned. Uh, about the the women who are not getting necessary treatment because the doctors are afraid they're going to go to jail and be accused of, of you know performing abortions and how do you choose it in, in that case when you've got a you know, fetus or right potential Good. life and and the mother yeah. I mean, and so it's it's certain states have decided that fetuses or potential lives are are more valuable, to use this language, more valuable than than life. living lives, right? And that's a, a societal choice they made, right? And uh, but to say that to say that there is, I would um, to to say that we don't always have to like weigh that is disingenuous too, right? And so you know. On the pro-choice side too, we're also weighing that choice sure. just in the on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. And so it it is a a value choice, right? But our side's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that that's that's I mean I agree I agree I agree and stands but, for both sides our side, but right. it but it's still but it's still an ethical question, right? Yeah. Well, I think in this particular issue, what's interesting to me is that we're very. Um, everything is HIPAA, that, you know, privacy protection of your health care. And yet we've just said that the constitutional right to privacy does not apply to women, but to women's reproductive care, which is base, the basis that 
Roe was turned over. Mm -hmm. Or oh, there's no right to privacy in the Constitution. Women have no right to privacy. Yeah, yeah. Not that's what they don't have. There's a number. <clears throat> to me, it's it's so what strikes me about it is that we've been, I think, seven of these classes, we have not been able to pinpoint what it, a human is yet. Right. So, you know, and that's a tough question. If you can talk that, about it. That's a really good. Point. Well, that's that's well, maybe it. We'll I get mean, to that in the AI section. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap it up. And we still don't know. So it's you know to me it's like what who I think you brought up last time about the people who are um, degrading because of physical limits. Um, are they human? Because we are you suggesting that some of the supposed people around the table are not human? No, I'm just I'm just suggesting we haven't defined it yet. And I'm I'm not sure we're going to be it. It hasn't been defined. Yeah. There we go. If it's not what? is it human? It is it's what? Right. It's so so yeah. well, I mean legally the question is is it a person versus a non-person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a, a fetus has all the same genetic makeup as a as a human. It's an right? argument from potential though. Yes. It's not well it's a I mean, it could be an argument from potential after you know thirty-five weeks or whatever. Then it's not. Then it's not potential anymore. Then it's not guaranteed yeah. until you actually have a birth. Nothing. Right. Nothing's guaranteed. Right. I mean, but, I'm not. I'm not trying to argue the pro-life yeah. stance here, but like yeah. it to say then you can have an abortion at eight months. Right. 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 And so yeah. Peter Singer, but but that. any but anybody you could argue then like I could drop dead right now with a heart attack, right? And then you could say then I'm you know. At that point that I'm having a heart attack, then it's you know now I'm not a person. So we're we're that in yeah. when you ask me. <laughs> right, no, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, so Matt, Matt listed out last week. Yeah. He asked Chat GPT list out a bunch of things. Yeah. Okay. You look at that list. There are many entities that I would like to consider human. Yeah. That would not fall into that list. Yeah. Like you know, I could name a bunch of them, and there are some that I. That don't fall on that list that I don't think are human. So right. yeah. So I think I think a good way to think of the, so the list of, that Matt had last week, and you know, cognition and and speech and and you know, uniquely human or how many chromosomes we have or whatever whatever it is, right the 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 genetic the genetic yeah. code that we have that makes us human. And so I think a lot of ethicists would say that you have to check off some of them and not make it exhaustive so like yeah you know so that's, that's you know it. someone someone who has no speech or is cognitively impaired but still human because they have these other things or right a baby so, doesn't have or a baby doesn't or have baby, any of those or, babies, right? yeah. or even or maybe even a fetus fetus for instance, right? right i think abortion is a much more nuanced argument it doesn't only speak to what is human mm -hmm. but it also mm -hmm. speaks i think to what is the responsibility of someone to nurture mm. another person? You know, can we force a woman to nurture uh, a human that's within her that she doesn't want to nurture? So, you know, no, so I, I'm not sure we can get it. I'm at the end, I want to give a famous uh, ethical thought experiment. Okay. 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 Good. Okay. So moving on. So we've been speaking about quality of life years assessments, and some of this has already come out in our discussion. But if you think about it, a cancer drug, and I think this is what you were alluding to, that only provides eight additional months of life, mm -hmm. won't achieve a maximum score in a quality of life, um, a quality of life year score. But to someone with that cancer who's facing certain death, and could have eight more months to price. Mm -hmm. So quality of life years don't exactly work so well in that situation. Quality of life years also disadvantages the disabled yeah. because they're already disabled. Mm -hmm. And unless whatever treatment that is completely removes their disability, their additional years are not, they're never gonna achieve the highest quality of life that's in that measure. So it disadvantages disabled people. And it's also particularly ill-suited for rare diseases because the way they decide the longevity of patients that have been treated with a certain treatment is by looking at a population of people. But if there's only data on half a dozen people, how do you even figure that out? 
and those are the drugs that are the million dollar type price tags. Okay. So, um, you know, how do you deal with this? And so governments and policymakers and all are constantly debating this and there's, mm -hmm. there's no good answer. So, um, you know, how do people actually decide to pay or not pay for treatment? They make decisions, but they're clearly not perfect decisions. And there's lots of ongoing debate around this. So talking a little bit about, I mentioned earlier that making decisions about R&D portfolios <laughs> is affected by how we value a life and how we value the improvement of a life by a drug. And just a little bit of background, the, the process to develop a drug starts with what's called preclinical work that's done in animals at a lab bench in a test tube to actually identify a lead compound that you want to put into per person, into man, uh, we mean people. Um, then you do your first safety studies in people. It's called phase one. Phase two, you do more human studies. Now you look at safety, but you also look at whether the drug works. Phase three, you again, Look at you always look at safety, you check your doses, you really establish in a statistically significant way that can convince FDA that this drug works and that it's safe in large confirmatory studies. So preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three. What are the odds that something that you made it to phase one with is ever gonna to get to the market. And this is the decision-making process that pharma and biotech companies go through. The odds are roughly 10%. They used to be even lower. Surprised they're actually that high. Get So maybe that's $25 million in, and you have a 10% chance of getting there. And I'm just making up numbers because they go from this range to that. You get to phase two, and maybe you've now spent $150 million. Your odds of getting to the market at best 20%. Even if in phase three, you've only hit about 50% and you could be into a billion dollars by then, depending on the type of drug that you're studying. And in fact, you can submit a drug for approval. And I saw this just yes, this morning or yesterday, if every day you see a big pharma drug get turned down by the FDA after they think it's ready. People have submitted to the FDA and the chances of still getting approved at that point are only in the 80s. So they really need numbers to not go out of business to figure out how to fill that portfolio of drugs that they're developing to benefit all of us. And there's been a lot of benefit for all of us. So from, just from being kind drugs. of naive here, but if there's a drug that's gone through this whole process and they've gotten to the, they've gotten the FDA and they've shown all these things, they've gotten through phase three, what what would be the reasons why the FDA would say no? Um, why it is as, as effective as they were hoping it to be? But well, it's, it's risk benefit. Idea. And so they may say, well, if the benefit is not enough to outweigh the risks because every drug has side effects. Right. Well, isn't it true that if a drug has not been proved, proven to be safe, it might not get approval? Yes. And there are some people that say someone who's going to die, if they're willing to take a chance, yeah. why shouldn't they have the opportunity to yeah. take the drug? Right. So um, because that's an individual saying that, Whereas when FDA approves something, it goes to everybody. And the people who are making those decisions are not necessarily you and I who are sick. It's our learned intermediaries, the physicians. And the, I think the FDA wants to be assured that there's a certain level of safety because physicians who are treating you are not the ones who know the pharmacology of the drug or are intimately associated with the um, hundreds of thousands of pages of data 
in the clinical Isn't trials. Is there legislation out now people that people will be allowed to try a drug? I think it... people have proposed legislation about, like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not there's, passed. There's like, I don't know if you want to talk about compassionate use. That's like well, a little that, bit of that, a little bit that of, is but, that exists. Yeah, but, that exists. Right, but that's typically for um, drugs that are in clinical trials, right. not for drugs that they have are, been rejected. That rejected, right? But you yes. get them ahead of time. For example, you know they're not quite ready, but dire situation. But it's very complicated. <laughs> I think that's basically what I'm saying. And um, you know the most recent data that I was able to find that the cost to bring a drug to market, average median cost to bring a drug to the market is $1.1 billion for a single drug. The mean is at $1.6 billion. Mm -hmm. And that includes a lot of failures along the way. So this is just a little bit of perspective on what drugs cost, not to- And I always thought a big question is, People, you know, go to the drugstore and stand in line and hear people complain about the cost of drugs. Yes. <laughs> and then you sort of say, who should be paying for these? Yes. Should it be society as a whole, or should drug companies be paying, making the drug, and then making a profit? And I think there's some real arguments as to which way it should go. Uh, I think right now, the structure in this country is such that the government doesn't have sufficient resources to do what the drug companies are doing. Yeah, so absolutely. So to me, the, to me, this is, and I work for a pharmaceutical company, and I'm very proud to work for one, but um, who really pays is the American consumer, mm -hmm. more than because we really fund a lot, because our prices are much higher, we're a huge market. Oh, you mean in the world? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so you're out of the world. Europeans yeah. or Canadians, they're yeah. paying less. Wait. Their governments are stepping in. We, as the American consumer, definitely because fund. making a profit not, is a God-given right. Or, or, or separate from making a profit, supporting the one billion dollars for the study. So, um, the American pay. American consumer well, by and large. We're, we're basically it, subsidizing right? the plan too much for the drugs compared to European equivalents. That's number one. But even before that, we've probably put a lot of money, federal money, into the development of the drug. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, we, we are funding it ourselves. We are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our pharmaceutical sector is extremely dynamic. Probably the most dynamic one in the world. So won't a pharmaceutical company spend more time trying to develop a drug that they know a lot of people will need, like diabetes or something, because so many people have it, where there might be some disease that you know not many people have, and they're not going to work on that because they're not going to make money. On that. I know a, I know a person here who's actually the president of the the area Mormons, and he. Um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he um, he works for a drug company that does orphan, what are called orphan drugs mm -hmm. for rare, rare diseases, uh, and they get the, a lot of the money from the government. Yeah, yeah. Right. so the government it's underwrites the orphan drugs. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. There's also incentives in yeah. the new orphan drug development because there were no orphan right. drugs right. until incentives were put in place, and so if you are developing for a drug that treats uh, less than where the incidence is less than 300,000 people in the U.S. There are, um, you know, bargains on the amount of money you pay to file. There are um, incentives for longer exclusivity than you would get from a regular drug. And, you know, there are all kinds of incentives, and that has actually boosted the development of orphan drugs by... Yeah, hundreds of percents okay. over the last 10 years, which is a good thing. Obviously, that works. Right, but I think you're right, too. And, I, you know, um, you you talked about the decision-making process when, where you're cutting some of these programs. Um, you're not going to... Your blockbuster or your billion-dollar drug is not going to be one of those. Of course, yeah. So that's really... Right. 
Right. And it's all driven by the economics and the cost mm -hmm. to do the development. Mm -hmm. and the fact that pharma companies are public companies with shareholders who want to make profits. Well, they have to make profits or they go under <laughs> they and they and they will still more drugs. There are many of them that get swallowed up the others. That's why we've seen incredible consolidation of pharmaceutical companies over the last yeah. 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I promised some science, so let's move on to some science, get away a little <laughs> bit from the um you know, the, the numbers and values of life. So um, I chose a few different re relatively recent innovations in science and in therapeutics um, that we debate about paying for because these things are really expensive or in some cases very expensive. Um, one is called RT, which stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. You don't need to remember that. Because I don't. Um, CRISPR, which um, is clustered, reg clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, and RNA technology, which you'll be more familiar with as the RNA vaccine mm -hmm. that was developed for COVID, but also um, other drugs that are about RNA I or RNA interference that interfere with the activity of molecule RNA. So just some little bit of basics, and then I have some videos because they'll describe this much better than me. So, um, you know, okay. so we start with DNA. It's inside the nucleus of the cell, and that's the code, the rules of life, basically, for all of us. And this DNA leads to production of something called messenger RNA. And it's literally what it says. It's the messenger. It's the instruction manual for the cell to make proteins that um, that run our lives, basically. And these RNA and DNA are inside something called the nucleus of a cell. But the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and it goes into this, what's this ribosome where it leads to the production of proteins. And the proteins are enzymes or the worker bees that really make everything happen in our lives. So this is just very, very basic in case um, in the videos, there'll be some discussion about this. Okay, so this one's not a video. So I mentioned CAR-T and that's been in the news in the last few days. This is actually a very, exciting new technology that's um, been used in various cancers. Um, what's done is you take, um, let's see, where's the beginning? Okay, from the patient, they take T cells out of the patient's blood and they introduce a new gene into the cells with a, using a virus to get into the cell's DNA so that reprograms the cell so that it makes a receptor which allows it the protein to target a cancer cell. You're suiting it up with a piece of armor and a sword. There you go. Um, and they, after they engineer the cells, they put them in culture and they grow them back up so they have a whole bunch of them. And then they give them back in, infuse them back into the patient so that these cells can seek out and destroy the cancer. Timeless. Sounds fabulous. Um, half a dozen drugs have been approved. Six FDA approved wow. CAR T therapies already. Uh, five of these um, had a label change in the last two days because they found out that very often the cancer, the cancer or a different cancer is coming back afterwards. Ooh. And that's, um, That's nice. this is just really in the news. You may see it. Um, I, one of them did not get the change in label. Mm -hmm. I think it's this last one, Parvicti. I don't know why it's that new, but I saw that this morning. But yeah. very exciting technology. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was developed at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. My company, I work for Johnson Johnson. We just, my site, I mean, not my site per se, but right down the road, big build out. Yeah, 
that's, right. I mean, that's for this uh, CAR T stuff they're working on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and actually, if you think about it, this is complicated. This isn't a pill of no, the. You're crazy. actually taking cells from patients' blood, bringing them somewhere else, fixing them up, and then putting them back in. So, is it a drug? It's really a procedure more yeah. than a drug, but it's considered a therapeutic and it's evaluated by the biologic section of the FDA. And this is one of the very new areas, even though there are six drugs approved, I think we're still learning more about it all the time. Very cool. So the second one is something called CRISPR and I'm just going to launch this YouTube. But first, I think you have to stop sharing first and then share the maximum. Oh no, I shared my whole screen, so I'm hoping. Let's see. So you gotta do it so that it uses the sound too. Oh. Okay. Right, so stop. So stop I just stop. Stop yeah, the share. And then you can share again. Yeah. Oh, share sound. It doesn't surprise me. We'll defrost something out of the permafrost and it'll sound as bad as the That permafrost defrost is freaking me out. Some weird disease from 10,000 years ago is going to pop out. Well, that's why the RNA is crystals. Volumes all the way up. Hopefully, this is going to work. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. Stop. Stop the yeah. Stop the share. Nice video. Um, so. So this is because it's going through there. No, sure. It was working yeah. earlier. Speakers are that's that's right. We have that kind of should be right. Unless it should be, maybe it's not running or so sure it is. Yeah, well I think that might be the one that we put them. Okay. Great. Great. Bottom right, the actual laptop volume is off. No, that's this one. Well this that's this is oh that one. Yeah. Line is on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, body saying, it's saying it's on the Yeti. Okay. Let's try. Yeah. Screen. Uh, fingers crossed. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome. Over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, Researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, 
known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. By the way, at the end, or we can circulate this going around, I have um, a set of resources, which includes the links to the videos that I'm going to show you, um, and a couple of other things, as well as a list of books about biotech and science, including The Codebreaker, which is all about how that was developed. It's very cool. I think it was uh, it's that method that was just written up maybe yesterday, where a little boy at the University of Pennsylvania chop had his the here, here. Yes, I was just going to mention that, that um, Eli Lilly announced that they restored hearing to, I think, in, yeah, get back to my... Yeah. They sort of hear by genetically helping they, his they, they found that this, uh, the, the problem this young boy's uh, yeah. deafness was corruptible by just replacing some of the little hair things in your ear, that would work. Amazing. That was developed, that was made at MIT, I believe the video. The video was. All white people. Kind of like. I mean, the production value. Yeah. yeah. That music. Yeah. So there's a group at MIT, and then there's a group at, I think, UCSF, somewhere around San Francisco, I've forgotten. Berkeley, right? Somewhere in California um, with um, Jennifer. Do, do yeah, it. she thinks it's Berkeley, right? And that's the code breaker yeah. that's a Walter Isaacson's mm -hmm. story about the whole story, but especially focusing on her. It's an, an amazing, a lot of amazing books on this. So inside, they're actually inside TIF, but uh, I think it's Vertex company that has recently been approved for the drug that uses CRISPR technology to correct defects in sickle cell. Yeah. Just yes. Yeah. In fact, December eighth yeah. was the first approval. So, so the the Lily, you know, hearing is just one person, but this is actually the first approval wasn't um, mentioned in the video, which was probably made before that. So on December eighth, um, the FDA oh got had a press release about I guess it's pronounced Cascavi, which is one of these therapies from Vertex about. Sickle cell disease. So one of the books on this list is about vertex, not about this, but about other work that was done in vertex. So yeah, just 
sign up, give me your email and I'll email you. So you have the links. Paper wasn't going to really give you the links. So that's up into picture. Um, awesome. Must be a very popular book to go breaker. I just looked it up. I get stuff from the library. Oh yeah. Several months wait. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> People yeah, all of those books are excellent. I'm, there's yeah. one or two I haven't read yet, but they still have very good recommendations. It's Code Breaker, her book, which is written for all the places. Well, Isaac, thank you. That is the Isaac. That's the Isaac symbol. That's the Isaac symbol. There's another the, one that's hard. It's written, I think, it's probably simpler than the Isaac. Yeah, it's it, better. It might be. It's much better. Really? What's was it similar? He's very chatty. She's very chatty. She's sick. Yeah. Yeah, What's I've read both of them, but I only put the Isaacson book on on the list. So, so the third thing that I promised was to talk about messenger RNA, which we've heard a little bit about RNA with the um, previous CRISPR. But um, if you think of messenger RNA as the instruction manual, um, you know it's the instruction manual really in an RNA vaccine that enables us to develop the immune response to COVID and other diseases, but RNA is also a treatment. And so we have another, oops, let's keep jumping around. So we have another YouTube video. So I think I have to yeah. stop share again. Yeah. And then yeah. and share and go to the actual. Is it, a, is it easy to answer how do you how do you do that process that we just saw on that last video? I mean, the idea of unzipping. Well, the, the neat thing about all this, I just make sure this doesn't. You know what I'm saying? Small, but like, small, but small. How do you do it? So with, these are all enzymes of different sorts that do this. They mention a nuclease and a nuclease is some, so ACE means sort of cutting and nucleic material like RNA, DNA. So a nuclease is to cut a nucleic acid. Um, so all of these are, di are different proteins with different functions. And the interesting thing, I don't know if you caught that, but this was all this all goes on in bacteria. There are, bacteria face as many viruses as we do. They're called bacteriophages. Um, and they, so bacteria have their own defense system, which I think really wasn't understood until, I'm not sure when this was discovered 20 years ago or whatever, taking a long time to figure out how to take this model in a bacteria and develop it into something that you can actually apply to a human. So that's the amazing part. <laughs> in a single celled organism and say, wow, look what this bacteria is doing. Hey, can we, uh, you know, MacGyver this and use it for humans, and that's basically what they did. So the bacteria is like the little Keebler elves that. It, yeah, yeah, and but it's by studying them and mimicking what they're doing, and um, it will. If you read that book, The Code Breaker, it shows you how complicated it was to get to the point of saying, "Yes, you can do this." Oh, yes, you can do it in a cell. Oh, yes, can you do it in a human? Various steps along the way to actually reach this point and who knows what the potential is for the future but that's if you think of how many diseases are genetic mutations which there's a lot out there especially all those rare diseases if you could fix them like sickle cell disease that's that's amazing to be able to fix sickle cell disease i think it all started with yogurt with and yogurt people, with people who were studying uh problems in yogurt infection. oh okay Old and whatnot viruses and yogurt. Uh -huh. Dan is the book is uh, instrumental. It could be. Yeah. 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 And so the code breakers, the beginning he goes through that, right? Doesn't he? That's right. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. that. Okay. So now let's hear about RNA, some of which you'll be familiar with from COVID, but maybe some not. Mm -hmm. All but mighty, exploring mRNA. Though submicroscopic, Messenger RNA, or mRNA, holds great potential for the future of healthcare. Copied from DNA and found in our cells, mRNA contains instructions for building proteins. But unlike DNA, the master instruction set, which stays in a cell's nucleus, 
mRNA is small enough to travel outside the nucleus to the cell's workshop where proteins are constructed. Recently, this tiny strand took to the global stage with the development of COVID-19 vaccines. While conventional vaccines work by sending a piece of a virus, bacterium, or other pathogen into the body, mRNA vaccines send instructions instead. To enter our cells smoothly, mRNA travels within a protective bubble called the lipid nanoparticle. Once inside, our cells read the mRNA as a set of instructions, building proteins that match up with parts of the pathogen called antigens. Your immune system sees these antigens as invaders, dispatching defenders called antibodies and T-cells, and training the immune system for potential future attacks. So if and when the real virus comes along, your body can recognize it, sounding the alarm to help defend against infection and illness. Beyond this, mRNA could also have potential use in cancer treatments, rare genetic disorders, and autoimmune diseases. Here at Pfizer, we're exploring the possibilities of mRNA, working towards breakthroughs that change patients' lives. Sorry for the commercial, but it was no, a good video. <laughs> Small but mighty, exploring the soundtrack for pharmacy commercials. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Who knows? Woo! Our heroes. Did J&J try to do it the old way? Yeah. No, it did not. No, 60% and then less and less did not work. Wait, we have to in here J&J, J J Novartis, Merck, no Pfizer. Yeah, medicine chest of the nation. All right. Harper, of course. Good one. Yeah, it's funny. I'm grateful. So we all know about the RNA vaccines for COVID. Um, but I mentioned that there's these other RNA type drugs, microRNA and SI, small interfering RNA that lead to these RNA interference products. And apparently there are four approved RNA eye therapies um, for diseases that you, the only one you may be particularly familiar with is hypercholesterolemia. This is for people with very severe high cholesterol. Um, these others are tend to be more orphan diseases, acute hepatic porphyria, a liver condition, hyperoxaluria, a metabolic, and then um, hereditary transthyroidin mediated amyloidosis. This is something where proteins glom together and form kind of plaques and cause problems for people. So I think actually all of these are orphan diseases. So can we talk a little bit about the fact that even if it's an orphan disease, some of the research and experience that the company gets can be extended mm -hmm. to yeah. other things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at, you know, some of the weight loss drugs today, which the the GDP of Denmark now. Right. It was because of right. Yeah. So interestingly, um, there there's a there are a whole range of inflammatory diseases um, that are orphan diseases. They're all very, very tiny, but there are thousands of them. Huh. And so many of them may have common yeah. Yeah. pharmacology behind them. So you may and, and this has been done in the past, Novartis had product like this that was developed for one orphan disease and then they found four other orphan diseases and so eventually over time they actually have a bigger product but are you going to talk about gut biome at all no i am not because i know nothing about it and so the, the so but, so if you have to hear if you, if you know you this share. great if not it's just a mind-blowing idea but um of the dna in your body yeah. Oh, Only ten yeah. percent belongs to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, we really are all of other Ninety percent of it belongs to the DNA of the bacteria in your gut. Yeah. So, so that that so that DNA, which is created by all sorts of things that have nothing to do with the genes you were born with, yeah. can be modified to change a yeah. lot. Yeah. So here. Right, like physical and mental health issues. So here, here's a philosophical question then. Mm -hmm. So what makes you human? What makes you human? Right. That's, that's if ninety percent of the DNA in your 
body. But in what you see is you feel as you is not you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I I've been, I've been hoping that, that we could get to a point where we could just pose that question because I think well, that's completely right. Or in a couple crazy. weeks, well, which is related to in a couple weeks when we put an artificial AI. intelligence in our head. Yep. Is that us too? How is that right? different? Right. And what I know about the gut microbiome um, in terms of drug development is the reason why I didn't bring it up here is because I don't think there are any products that are so close been, to the market. Mm. Um, there's a lot of research around this mm -hmm. and maybe in the future um, there will be, but there's still a tremendous number of challenges uh, about drug delivery and what are you actually changing and what's the target right. and you know, how do you, one of the issues with drug development is when you study a population of people, they're not, they're not mice. Mm -hmm. They're not inbred mice or yeah. rats mm -hmm. from, um, that you bought and they're all the same. They're all extremely different. And so you get a lot of variability in the data that you collect, right? You can imagine based on how you eat and how you've been brought up and where right. you've been, where you've lived your microbiome, everybody in this room, I'm sure has a different microbiome. So I went to it was a lecture. really hard to study. Yeah, I went to a lecture by a woman at Harvard who was studying um, gut biome related to obesity. And uh -huh. she was actually working with the, the people who had done the uh, Biggest Loser program. Uh -huh. And um, all of whom lost, you know, a ton of weight. And then came after the program, they gained it back faster than they, um, than they had lost. Well, then, there, it, it got bad, mm -hmm. and um, she was able to show with these fecal transplants where they emptied your gut and uh -huh. replaced the bacteria with healthy mm -hmm. bacteria that they she could get them back onto a normal um, oh, weight wow. gain trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, it was recent. It was there, there's definitely but clear connections between the gut and the brain. Yeah. As well, it's not just obesity, yeah. which is really sort exciting. of logical. But there's a lot of um, well, there are a lot of articles that say you don't even need a drug, that you can change your eating patterns to make a difference. I don't know how much of a difference, but they're saying that you can eat certain that's foods. That's the general from, argument behind you know, probiotic yogurts. And, right. um, well, that's the idea of modifying the yeah, sour right. Lots of sour right. Right. That can help you I'll change it by yourself. To the start. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how is. successful that yeah. is but in it's saying, controlled clinical trials. Yeah. But it doesn't yeah. mean that it's so not correct. It just means it's yeah, complex. really yep. hard to study. Right. And it's yeah. hard enough to study drugs. Yeah. So... Um, my last slide is for the um, those folks in on the Zoom who haven't seen what I've handed around the room. And if anybody um, who's on Zoom and would like some of the resources that are on this slide, they can just email me. My email address is on there, and I will send you the um, paper with the suggested books if you're interested and the links to those videos, and I think another one as well if you want more information. So that's just for everybody on the Zoom. Yeah. Right. So thank you. thank you all for your interesting, interesting discussions and adding to the discussion. And I know the rabbi wants to do this. Oh, no, we don't have to add questions. But first yeah, questions first. from Susan. Yeah. You started off by sort of working through how much it costs to develop a drug. You talked about the 1.6 billion, substantial amount of money. Mm -hmm. And now you've talked about all these great breakthroughs. And is it worth for society in spending the money to develop? It? You know, aren't we good enough where we are right now? Why should we, why should we reach out and try to cure this disease? Well, I would think it's human nature mm -hmm. to always yeah. want to improve. And we wouldn't be where we are today if that hasn't been true for ever. So is that is that one thing, maybe that to chuck, you know, one more thing on our list of what makes us human is the ability to uh, use medicine to improve our lives. I mean, I know my dog, my dogs, you know, eat the grass in the backyard to make themselves throw up. Is that, you know, that's kind of, that's their you know, that's drug treatment. so that they, they have some sense of a drug treatment, but they don't do clinical trials for it, right? They, but they never plan ahead. 
They never plan ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Where are they going to do that they particular they weekend? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, like, but, but, I mean, there are, there are, there are people who think that, you know, uh, using medicine is against God's will, yeah, right? Absolutely. And, you know, but I would say mo most people don't believe that. But and and humans really always have figured out medicine. Right? It comes down to this, you know, the other figure that I've often heard is we spend most of our healthcare dollars during the last year of life. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Should we just cut off that last year of life? So how do you know what the last year is? Well, no, but to your point, sometimes you kind of do know what the last year is or the last yeah. year to kind yeah. of do know. So that's yeah. legit. So who should be making this? Right. You're not always right. The, you're not always right, but it you know it you're not always right, but so actually you kind of could have a sense of when as an individual you want you course. Yeah, that's right. what that's what we're talking about. Yeah. No, well, it depends. I, I don't know. Depends on what I'm suffering. I love this I idea, though. Like, yeah, this is true, right? Mm -hmm. They will say, "I'm not paying for this treatment." Mm -hmm. That sickle cell anemia treatment is over a million dollars. So, I don't imagine too many insurance companies ever want to see this thing as something that's offered other than by Medicare. Uh, although, just think about it. It's a life. This is a, a one-time cure. I think I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. In the last years sure. of life. So how much are they paying for that heart person's entire life yeah. for sickle cell cell treatments? Because they're in and out of a hospital constantly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that probably yeah. does have yeah. a good a lot of skills. And cystic yeah. fibrosis yeah. and other things. <laughs> you think about like hey, yeah, what we're gonna talk about next. Yeah. Jason, I hope you're still there. Uh AI or an AI robot or an AI device doesn't have DNA. Yeah. Um but it does have code. It, it does have code. code so yeah. is it is that gonna is there gonna be some parallel there where we say, well we already know that, right? We already know that computer that AI can is so complex that it's modifying itself and humans don't fully understand what, what it's doing to itself. So right. but are you really understand how complicated DNA, and it's not just DNA, but between DNA and life, there's proteins, there, you know. I know, but I mean, I, I thousands know. of proteins in your body right. and different profiles. I want to argue, I want to argue that the human yeah. is more complex than it, but I know, I know it's yeah. already gotten to the point where we, there are, there, that humans don't fully understand the code, the code behind what's going on in AI because AI is creating its own code. So, yeah, yeah. so it is complex. Is it is the question that, that you're asking, is it is it just a metaphor to say that we are a biological machine? Or is that actually, question, are we I, actually a bi um, are we that different than a machine than a machine? Yeah. But yeah. ours is just you know carbon based or Matt that's said it's so months ago yeah. versus so yeah. Yeah. it was yeah. I go your oh, go ahead. To, to me, it's going back to, in both situations, we're not clear of what's this. Yeah. Right. I, that's not yeah. in both situations, they're not really clear of the causes. Yeah. So well, we're the cause of the, the, the well, we don't know what like but like but like what the AI is to your point, what yeah. the AI is doing. We don't yeah. exactly know the cause yeah. and the biological. Uh, entities that we are, we don't completely know the cause. We have ideas in both cases. It's, uh, that's what you were getting that with you. Right. right. If we don't understand all the biology, and we're a long way from understanding that, um, how could we even make that leap into a machine to help a machine figure that out? Mm -hmm. So I think we're a long way from even coming close, but maybe I should save that for the AI discussion. Just knowing, you know, I've told you about a lot of exciting things that are going on in science, and it sounds like, wow, we've got it all figured out. We barely scratched the surface of the genome. But it doesn't mean you need so, to know everything to have an impact or oh, to be positive. We, you know, we, we need to be the arena. 
We yeah, clearly yeah. have impact, well, but we're a long way from that. And when we get to like, the point of thinking we know the genome, there's going to be something else that something we need else. to figure out. Like, yeah. Something. So what? I read, uh, you know, Star Trek and Judaism have a nice connection. So on the internet, they often come together. <clears throat> Uh, and someone decided to figure out how much information is actually stored in DNA in order to make transporters possible. And someone looked at the code and the amount of information positive. And they had 16.7 petaflops of information in a single cell. In a single cell, which means there's more information and in the cells, DNA yeah. than the entire history of the internet has produced. Wow. All right. And somehow you're supposed to be able to like blink it and reproduce it over there in a second with a transporter. So just an interesting, so I mean, we can figure out the genome. We got a lot more to go, right? Like there's a lot of information. Holy smokes. I have another question. The question is, which we have not talked about at all and we don't have time for, but I wish we had more sessions. What exactly is a thought? Uh, what, what is, is a no, no, no. Oh, I can. No, we may get pass on it. We may get to that actually. So after, so we have after tonight, we have two more sessions of our series, and then in April we're going to have a scholar in residence. Who, yeah, yeah. Who, who is an expert Full weekend activity? Yeah, we should. We're behind on advertising, but we'll look into it. She's a she's a she's a um, expert in 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 Jewish philosophy, but also. Uh, she studies neuroscience. Oh, really? and, she, and she started her career as one of the first female Maimonides scholars yeah. in the West. Right. And so, right. female Maimonides scholar, a scholar so of Heidi, Maimonides and Spinoza. Heidi, Ra Heidi Raven. Yeah. Heidi, Heidi, Heidi Raven. Raven. R A V V E N, right? Yep. Two V's, yeah. Yep. Her, Heidi Ra Raven at Hamilton College. And she, she had a, a huge uh, grant to study neuroscience and how it, to study neuroscience and ethics. And with her expertise in medieval Jewish thought, and she wrote a, a beautiful book that I'm working through, and um, and she will come in and teach us. So ask her that wow. question, and I think that would be so a, a, a well. I mean, yeah, yeah. Hamilton, Hamilton College. Yeah, she's yeah. involved. Yes. she's awesome. Right, we don't know it. We don't know what consciousness is, right? Um, and, you know, synapses in, uh, April in, in mediators, <laughs> something like that. But yeah. yeah, that's all I know. The week, the weekend of uh, April fifth, sixth, right? Yeah. yeah. April 5th, 6th. Wow, Rabbi. That's okay. it. And that's all part of the grant that we got oh, for trying to, and and uh, the money that I would love if you would help donate. Yes, yes, we we are looking for people who want to sponsor the events, etc. Yeah, yeah. But um, but friends, uh, was that? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Susan, for for inviting us. Thank you all for a great. Uh, conversation. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks uh, with uh, with Jason Albert, who I called was on my mind. Oh, there you go. And, uh, and we will be talking about AI. Jason is a is a uh, uh, rap. Um, I got yeah, intellectual uh, probably government 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 institution, but works a lot with AI. Right, write a book and do research and so. But if she does, how do we restore babies? And so, but okay, so we were talking about abortion before. You want me to give okay. five seconds? I'll give the ethical, ethical thought experiment. I hope I'm getting it. I'm trying to remember okay. if I get it right. And I forgot who proposed it. So I apologize. I'm, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure it was a woman, a uh, philosopher, uh, ethicist. So um, you um, wake up one day, or let's say a woman wakes up one day to find herself in a hospital. And there are tubes going from her into a guy in a bed in a bed next to her. Doctor comes over. She's like, "What? What's going on?" She's like, "Oh, we have this world famous violinist right here who has this very rare kidney disease, and he needs to use your kidneys for nine months so that he could live." Yeah. So this is uh, okay. We 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 could have it. <laughs> so. So there's a, there's a famous thought experiment about, you know, I mean, it's not only about abortion, but about, about abortion. So here's an interesting thought experiment. That I, so, uh, about it's about nurturing too. She's being forced to nurture yeah. someone else. Yeah. Why, why is he a famous violinist? I mean, that, that's- He has that, something to contribute. He has something yeah. to contribute yeah. to the world. Yeah. Well, so, 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 so pre-row, so pre 
there's usually potentially three people, three potential entities involved in giving birth. Mm -hmm. So obviously the woman who has the most stake, mm -hmm. okay, the man, and uh, the unborn child, mm -hmm. right? So who has the least choice? Of those three. Yeah. Three. Um, the unborn, the unborn child. child. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have a. He, I mean, how do you know he must be born? Right. Right. Or so you, you know none, it, right? none of us had any. None of us had any yeah. about We have no time. So. I mean, there, 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 there are philosophers today, today who are yeah. yeah. so, who say we are making the choice of perpetuating human right. life. They don't have the choice. Have We're choice. choosing for people to potentially suffer. There are exactly. people who say that souls decide who they're going to like, you know, yeah, right. they're going to be. So yeah. they actually do have a choice. There you go. Yeah. I mean, sure. that's so as dependable as any of the other stuff. You right? can't prove that with that. Yeah, yeah. You can't prove that. yeah true. true. Yeah, anyway. All right. All right. <laughs> so friends, have a, have a so good Thank you. 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 Thank you.